Good afternoon, uh, everyone, or good afternoon, assuming everyone is in the European time zone, at least. Um, welcome to all of you joining us for this second event in the GovTrend final conference series. So my name is uh, Harald van Asselt, and I'm a professor of climate law and policy with the University of Eastern Finland, and I'll be the uh, moderator of today's event. Now, the series of events that this is part of marks the end of the first three-year term of the Jean Monnet Network GovTran, and GovTran stands for Governing the European Climate and Energy Transition in Turbulent Times. And the GovTran project is led by the Free University of Brussels in collaboration with uh, not only United, the University of Eastern Finland, but also Ghent University in Belgium and the University of East Anglia in the UK. And as part of the project, we've published a range of special issues, policy briefs, we've organized a MOOC, and we've organized a series of events, including this final conference series. The project has sought to examine EU climate and energy policy against the background of broader geopolitical shifts, with a view also to bridging academic and policy discussions. And some of you may have joined us already yesterday when we had an excellent first event with keynote speaker Diederik Samsung. And today, uh, today we'll take a deep dive into an issue that was also mentioned already during yesterday's event. It's an issue of ongoing salience in EU climate policy, and that is the relationship with trade policy. Now, following the EU Green Deal, we know that climate protection has become a core objective of EU trade policy. And this is confirmed in the recent trade policy review that was released by the European Commission, which specifies that this means, among others, that the Paris Agreement will become an essential element in future trade and investment agreements, and also that the EU will promote climate and sustainability actions in the context of the World Trade Organization, the WTO. Moreover, the EU is increasingly considering the use of trade-related measures to pursue its, climate, pursue its climate policy objectives, as evidenced most prominently by the proposal for a carbon border adjustment mechanism, which was released in, in July, the, or the CBAM. And in addition to this, the EU has also taken steps to strengthen the enforcement of commitments made in the trade and sustainable development chapters of its various free trade agreements. Now, this roundtable will take a step back and think about how far the EU has actually come in mainstreaming climate change consideration in its trade policy, but also think of and discuss the challenges that still lie ahead. Now, before I uh, go on and introduce the, the speakers that we have on, the, on our panel today, uh, just a few household remarks, and you'll probably have seen some of them already in the chat just now. First, as you can see on the, in the top left corner, is that this webinar is being recorded. And second, we strongly encourage all of you to post your comments, to post your questions in the Q&A box. Just note that the chat will be disabled during this webinar, but you can post them all in the Q&A box. You can also vote for comments, the ones that you like, the ones that you really would like to have answered. And I'll try and take them up uh, towards the end of the session. Now, on to our roundtable, and I'll try to keep my introduction as, as short as possible. We have four very distinguished panelists, and starting with Madeleine Tuinegen, who is the head of units responsible for trade and sustainable development at DG Trade of the European Commission. And she will be followed by Antoine Auger, and he is the head of the Global Challenges and the SDGs team at the Institute for European Environmental Policy. Then we welcome Caroline Deer Birkbeck. And Carolyn is the Director of the Forum on Trade, Environment and the SDGs, as well as a Senior Researcher at the Graduate Institute in Geneva, an Associate Fellow with the Chatham House and a Senior Research Associate at the University of Oxford. And last but certainly not least, we have Laura Zankerschmidt, who is an Assistant Professor in European Law at the University of Amsterdam. Now, we've asked each of the, the panelists today to provide an, uh, some opening remarks for uh, between five and 10 minutes. And after that, we will move on to a moderated uh, discussion a moderated question and answer session. Um, and as I said already, we can very much base these on uh, questions and answers that will come up in the Q&A box in the course of uh, the opening interventions. So without much uh, further ado, I wanna give the floor first uh, to Madeleine who can provide the opening remarks uh, from the perspective of the, the commission. So Madeleine, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much. And, and thanks a lot for, for inviting um, the commission and DG Trade to this event. It's uh, my pleasure. Um, as always, it's a pity that I cannot see um, all of you. 
um, but I, I hear that um, there are quite some participants. It's a very important topic and you, you place me immediately for a big challenge to talk between five and 10 minutes. So when I'm too long, um, cut me short. Um, so I'm going to enter a bit into um, um, what we believe is the positive role of trade policy um, uh, in the EU Green Deal. Um, and then some main elements of EU trade policy review um, uh, labeled an open, sustainable and assertive trade policy. Uh, and that includes uh, what we try to seek in the WTO what, um, uh, on climate, what we are doing in our free trade agreements through the so-called trade and sustainable development chapters when it comes to addressing climate uh, concerns and then a word on autonomous measures. So, but let me, and I think it is really important to, to emphasize at all occasions that trade policy um, is not just a, a WTO compatibility um, activity, trade, uh, um, trade policy and trade can play a positive role um, in greening um, um, our economies. Um, trade and uh, climate policy are portrayed as being contradictory, but trade and particularly the right trade policy has a positive impact on the environment. Open trade policies make a positive contribution by, for example, ensuring the most efficient use of resources, provided the environmental costs are priced in, um, uh, are priced in, hence the importance of carbon pricing. Second example, disseminating green technologies and facilitating trade in their components. Third example, um, leveraging our negotiating and market power in a way to increase um, the ambition on environmental policies. And fourth example is using our trade and investment agreements as platforms uh, to increase corporations um, on environmental policies. But there's more we can do, and that's what we committed to in the trade policy review. So what are the main points? Um, a first remark to make is that um, the, those who followed EU trade uh, policy communications uh, will have noticed that this is the greenest trade strategy ever. Um, I, I think green appears numerous times. I haven't counted them on, on every page of this strategy. Um, concretely, we are bringing forward sustainability initiatives at the WTO, and I'll get back to that. Uh, we are developing ambitious TSD chapters in our trade deals. I'll also get back to that. We are seeking commitments from the biggest emitters, notably G20 countries on climate neutrality. Um, we're making um, res the respect of the Paris Agreement as an essential element for future trade agreements. Um, we're bringing in strong autonomous measures, including the already adopted carbon border just adjustment mechanism, CBA. Um, we are developing new legislation to avoid placing products issued from deforestation on the market. And we are updating the generalized system uh, scheme of preferences which will help us to work with developing country partners to meet the targets of the Paris Agreement. Well, a few words on the WTO and what we're seeking to promote there. So priority is the inclusion of climate considerations for us. Um, and that is, has, is, is, has seen the central element in the trade policy uh, review. We are working, we are, we are, our ambition for MC12 is twofold. One, uh, if there is a multilateral statement, I have to say, if there is, um, uh, there should be a strong paragraph uh, on the relevance of climate um, and environment in there. But in addition, we are working and their concrete work is now ongoing on a plurilateral state, the statement um, that sets out our determination to increase the role that trade can play in tackling climate change and supporting a circular economy. The statement should cover all dimensions goods and services, transparency, um, domestic measures, and a strong development dimension, and bring new ways of integrating these various aspects together. Um, there is a very delicate balance to be found, um, uh, to have on the one hand, as many members as possible, including developing countries, participate truly in all these elements, on the one hand, and on the other hand, to have a good level of ambition. And I'm saying that that is a challenge because we come from um, a history where we've tried to negotiate an environmental goods agreement, nearly succeeded. We didn't succeed. This was 2016. On reflection, um, there are shortcomings in the approach we had. And one of them is that we uh, are accused and we are perceived that having been a rich man's club, 
um, doing a little agreement with the most ambitious one. So it is very nice to set very high ambitions, but we also need to find a, a reasonable level of ambition that buys in also developing countries. So uh, we do not want a repeat of, of the EGA in that sense. Um, and we want better interconnections. I think we have a different vision of the world. We, we are looking much more into footprint and supply chains of, of goods, and we need to integrate that also in our discussion. So concretely, what we think uh, we should go for is uh, launching exploratory discussions on modalities or a framework for uh, liberalization of green goods and services. Um, and uh, with that, also look into how to address non-tariff uh, and regulatory issues, whether that is classical barriers to trade or more questions linked to how products are produced and how do we go about sustainable supply chains. Um, transparency is also important. We are looking uh, into possible approaches to reduce fossil fuel subsidies, for example. Um, and um, as I said, the development dimensions is critical. So we are listening well to um, what we hear and uh, are looking into whether it is with greening aid for trade or other ways to find out how can we include um, uh, developing countries into this. Few words on um, uh, bilateral and the TST chapters. Um, uh, we already have a solid cooperation at bilateral level with our TST chapters, but I think most of you will know that we are um, um, undergoing now this um, uh, trade um, uh, TSD review, a review of these chapters in our bilateral agreements that's taking place now. We are in a uh, public consultation, which we opened on 19 July, and stakeholders will be able to submit their views and proposals until the end of October. Already the trade policy review, as I said, has important elements that step up the climate ambition, like um, uh, essential elements clause and the Paris agreement for future agreements should be part of that. Um, and um, uh, uh, a requirement that we include negotiations only with partners um, to the extent that it's G20 partners that have committed um, uh, to uh, high ambitions in Paris. Um, and these chapters cover uh, the broad scale of environmental and, and, and climate um, relevant international agreements. A few words finally on autonomous measures and including CBAM. Um, so, and this is also the direction that you clearly see in a trade policy review, and that is how do internal measures support um, our international agenda and vice versa. So addressing global challenges like climate change will require international cooperation, but at the same time, we need to, uh, to ensure that trade does not undermine the effectiveness of our domestic policy on climate change. So the, the carbon border adjustment mechanism and future proposals on mandatory due diligence on the sustainable government uh, corporate governance initiative and on deforestation are cases in point. Um, now on CBAM, you know that we presented our proposal, part of Fit for 55. Um, uh, it is fully compatible with the WTO um, and I can elaborate on that. Um, but the point I wanted to make here is that We've also not only focused on making it WTO compatible at the, um, at the measure side, but also insisted a lot on an external strategy. And we, from the outset, been very transparent in our approach to CBAM and also other me measures, engaging in very early stages in dialogues at all levels. And this continues bilaterally in the WTO, G20, OECD, and other fora. Um, I'll leave it here because I think I try to package it within five to ten minutes that you gave. Excellent. Thank you, Madeleine, and thanks also for indeed sticking uh, sticking to that, uh, but also to give uh, a great bird's eye view of indeed uh, what the EU is doing at multiple levels um, and to basically give an indication and update of, of where the EU's trade policy is standing now. Um, so the next speakers will, of course, uh, come uh, from outside of the Commission, so they'll provide a bit of, a, of an external uh, view of what's, what's happening. Um, but I think uh, all speakers will at least touch upon some of the elements, so the multilateral level, um, the, the EU bilateral level, so what's happening in the, in the TSD chapters, as well as the autonomous measures uh, to varying degrees. So as I said, the first uh, speaker uh, will be Antoine uh, Auger uh, from the Institute for European Environment Policy. So Antoine, uh, like Madeleine, you have five to 10 minutes uh, and uh, you can share your views 
in the, in that time. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Haro, and thank you very much for for inviting us for inviting the IEP to this uh, to this event. And hello, everyone. Uh, indeed, I would like you to uh, maybe perhaps try to bring in a bit of an external uh, point of view of this issue of how to mainstream sustainability in the EU uh, trade policy and build on what uh, Madeleine has just, uh, provided us, the details that she has just uh, provided us. Because as you know, uh, as the EU has the first trade bloc in the world, it remains obviously highly influential on the world stage at all levels that you've mentioned, at the multilateral level, at the bilateral level, and with uh, kind of autonomous measures that we can um, that we can implement. So I would like to structure the kind of points that I wanted to make around this um, around this level, as you said. So, if we want to start with the overall objective of this discussion and of the discussion of the coming years, of course, is to support how to mainstream climate and environmental issues in EU trade policy or in fine having net positive impact in sustainable development. That is what this is all about. And this is what we should keep in mind, I think, because as we know, EU trade, trade policy in general is can be highly obviously technical with a lot of legal uh, entanglements. And so I think it's always important to have, to keep in mind the global, the global objective when we have this kind of, of discussion. So for trade to have a net positive impact in sustainable development, I think is crucial. Um, Looking at the multilateral level, um, as we know, this uh, past few months, hopefully, has seen some kind of uh, kickstart again of the of the machinery after some uh, difficult years, if we can put it if we can put it like that, uh, with the appointment of the new director general, with the uh, perhaps the main member that will be more willing to engage in uh, multilateral uh, discussions. We will see, I suppose, at the MC12 uh, coming up here in, now in December, whether this uh, multilateral level is actually indeed back into core. Uh, as Madeleine mentioned, at the moment, what we can see is as most of the meaningful discussions, however, at the more at the plurilateral level, so between members, they are uh, in particular at the end of last year, this uh, new uh, initiative that has been brought by 50 members of the WTO on the trade and environmental sustainability structured discussion. So this is, a, as I said, a group of uh, 50, so quarter of the WTO members, a uh, third of the WTO members, would bring together and try and engage into discussion to bring forward some issues related to uh, the uh, trade in environmental goods. Since the discussion of the multilateral on the environmental goods agreement have been stalled if they or at least have not been moved much since in the last uh, five years. So this new initiative uh, brings together some influential members of the WTO with the EU, the UK, such as Japan or Korea and, uh, and others, Canada and so on. But some major members such as US or China, for instance, are, are missing. So that was obviously a challenge in the scope of and the strength of this uh, discussion of how far it can go to uh, advance measure at, uh, at, the, at the international level. So as Manuel has said, between these uh, TSSD discussions and the discussion of the environmental, environmental good agreements, the idea is still to foster trade on a number of important environmental related products, related such as renewable energy products, such as solar panels, so some resource efficiency uh, products of waste related to waste and so on. We know, for instance, that at the moment, as we speak, there is some uh, advanced discussion on plastic, trading plastic issues that we know could be one of the major elements coming out of MC12. So that would be, of course, a welcome um, uh, progress in this kind of uh, discussion. It proves that trilateral discussions, sectoral discussions, can happen, can have meaningful results, tangible results, and eventually, perhaps, I would suppose that this is a message that I would like to pass on the multilateral level. Is that hopefully it can, it can help kickstart the momentum again, the kind of momentum that could bring to the conclusion of the trade facilitation agreement, for instance, eight years ago, which was the main milestone since the WTO was created. So we are not there yet, but hopefully this kind of sectoral, trilateral discussions can be a momentum toward this kind of uh, in members engagement. Um, 
moving to the bilateral level, uh, as Madeleine had said, a uh, very important aspect of course of EU trade policy, almost half of EU trade is now conducted through a bilateral level. And so we've mentioned obviously the issue of the trade and sustainable development chapters in FTAs that are negotiated. And this is probably one of the main challenges at the moment is how to properly operationalize measures that are involved in the trade and sustainable development chapters. This is um, it is working, it shows that it is working, it shows that the latest, and there is a progress among the latest free trade agreements that have been signed that demonstrates a willingness by all uh, parties to uh, strengthen the provisions related to these, these aspects in the FTAs. But perhaps there is a way that we could do more on this. So this, this would be good, would go with the putting together some uh, uh, effective targets, some timelines, and so on to ensure that, the, again, these provisions on sustainability, on environmental and social sustainability are actually, um, can be more well monitored and well operationalized. Um, I wanted to talk about, yeah, we, we could talk perhaps later on in the discussion about the uh, sustainable impact assessment and the involvement of uh, civil society organizations, which could be another vehicle to foster sustainability in free trade agreements, but perhaps we can use that for the discussion for the round. And lastly, a couple of words on the uh, autonomous move that the EU can, uh, can make. We've mentioned about CBAN, which is a welcome uh, in development, although it brings in a lot of uh, challenges when it comes to the scope, when it comes to the implications for climate vulnerable countries uh, that when they will face the, the CBAM regulation and how this could be compensated for sustainable development in these countries, whether it is through a redistribution mechanism of the uh, revenues made or whether it is through exemptions. So this is a debate that is, uh, that is uh, at the moment ongoing. When uh, the issues of comp compatibility with the WTO, as Madeleine has said, this has been hopefully largely resolved and hopefully should not uh, be too much in the year and the years to come. Very quick word on the GSP system, as Madeleine again mentioned, this GSP and especially the GSP plus systems are very good vehicle to foster sustainable development through trade policy. At the moment, the GSP plus systems are the system that brings in some uh, environmental and uh, social uh, obligations to participate to the system. It has a limited number of countries, only nine at the moment, and so uh, good uh, progress for the years to come to be to, to try and push for more countries to be involved in that particular system, of course. And last but not least, uh, this is a, not, not a new debate, but the debate that has some momentum at the moment is on the EU uh, standard setting influence and how this could be a way to bring in new um, um, measures to defend sustainability, to, to promote sustainability outside of our borders. The EU has a major influence in standard setting around the world, of course. And we've known that we've been able to implement standards on sanitary, phytosanitary issues, for instance, that are quite stringent and yet are a very important part of our trade policies at the moment. So this could also be a quite an innovative approach to uh, bring in uh, some uh, sustainability in the EU trade policy. Um, I would like to stop there at the moment to not go way over the, the time allocated, but of course, with these are options that we can discuss further on. Thank you, Harold. Thank you, Antoine, and indeed, we'll, we'll have plenty of opportunity. Uh, you mentioned the, the trade and environmental sustainability structure discussions. Uh, our next speaker um, will probably have to move on there late today as well, because those discussions are happening uh, today as well, including on trade and climate change, so maybe some of the other panelists and, and uh, participants will have to go there. Um, so our next uh, speaker is indeed uh, someone who has been very well first in, in some of the, the goings on in, in Geneva. Um, so Carolyn, uh, also for you, you have five to 10 minutes and the floor is all yours. Great, thank you very much, Haro. Thank you for the invitation to be here today. Um, so I'm gonna try and address two of the questions that were um, put to us. The first was around how uh, the EU could move uh, multilateral discussions on trade and climate protection forward. So I think that in order to answer this question, we need to reflect a little on the multilateral context first. And Madeline herself has referred to how important it is to, to, to see the possibilities in the context um, of, of wider issues. 
at the WTO. So you have a complex on, in the multilateral setting, you have a complex environment on the multilateral trade side, you have a WTO where there are a lot of tensions around issues like access to vaccines, trade responses and recovery from COVID-19, ongoing concern about failures to deliver on development priorities, US-China tensions, and great uncertainty about US um, positioning on any number of issues at the WTO. Um, on the multilateral climate diplomacy side, you also have many tensions and a lot of them around inadequate finance for developing countries and ensuring that they um, can mitigate and adapt um, uh, to climate change. We also have no consensus at the WTO that it is a place to tackle climate issues and we know multilateral consensus. So there are some countries that continue to specifically say that they do not want to have these, these um, issues discussed there. So hence this um, plurilateral effort that Madeleine referred to. Um, and we also have this setting where for developing countries, they really see the multilateral arena as one where countries can and should try to rise above some of their bilateral power politics. I mean, that for them is a reason to engage in a multilateral system is because they're more protected from some of that, um, those pressures. So I'm gonna focus um, my comments, rest of my comments on the WTO context as that's what I know best. And so the first is that I think we really have some important reasons for optimism um, on the scope for trade and climate discussions and the role that the EU can play within that context. The first is that we have this key group of developed countries that are keen to advance um, work on these issues with high climate ambition and who want to use trade and trade policies to advance climate action, You know, as Madeleine um, has outlined. We also have a development where many developing countries, especially the poorest and most vulnerable among them, recognize the economic impacts of climate change and the trade impacts. This is not the same discussion we may have been having 10 or 20 years ago. There's an understanding that environment and trade issues are intimately linked and that they need to be tackled. Um, and part of that is also a recognition that trade related climate policies have arrived. Um, they're not gonna go away. Um, so there's a recognition of the need to discuss and coordinate on them to avoid tensions and to ensure that they actually have impact um, and are effective. But of course, the challenge is how to do that. But I think there's recognition that, that, that these issues need to be grappled with. And of course, you also have the DG who's supporting um, action at the WTO or recognizes the importance of the WTO contributing to solutions to global challenges like climate change. So you have that a sort of a good environment in that respect. Um, the thing that I really wanted to underline today is there's a practical reason also for multilateral approaches. You know, the environmental reality is we need trade policy to support economic transformation everywhere. We need more climate friendly production and consumption everywhere. And that will require a multi-pronged sort of nuanced approach um, to trade policy that focuses on solving particular problems in supply chains, in terms of access to technologies and so on. Um, and we need to ensure that trade policy um, incentivizes change. We want to push um, ambition among the key players and competitors, but we also need to find a way to support and enable change in other countries that face more challenges in climate mitigation um, and adaptation. Um, so of course, in the trade arena, we always have this focus on competitiveness, um, but it's also imperative here, if we want to advance the climate agenda, that we have to be able to see that this needs to be about enabling other countries to build and expand their own green industries while also reducing their emissions. If we only focus through a competitiveness lens, I mean, we're not gonna bring the rest of the world with us in terms of the economic transformation that, that we need to see from a climate um, point of view. Now, much of the discussion is ha that's happening on climate and trade now is happening bilaterally and transatlantically. And as I said before, this is really important because this is where we can tackle some of the key competitiveness issues among major powers, but we need a space for dialogue multilaterally for coordination and cooperation that can complement these other efforts um, and that are more inclusive. You know, even the G20, these are not inclusive of a huge part of the world that needs to be part of this transformation. It's complicated, um, but necessary, and it will require a lot more balance and nuance than you can see in what you might say bilaterally or what you might say to a domestic constituency about what the priorities look like. So it's something that will need to be nurtured, I think, at the WTO to, to, to move forward a discussion where we can engage anyone is it. So it's, I don't feel it's gonna be a place where we're gonna have great headlines about a new breakthrough on X or Y. We're gonna say, wow, the breakthrough is countries are agreeing to cooperate and coordinate on what are really, really tough and complex issues. Um, so uh, just briefly on the, um, 
And in terms of the constraints, the key one is that developing countries are very concerned they're going to be left out, that they will be further marginalized in the green global economy than they already are in the global economy. And, and the risk is we don't want to create a two tiered economy where we have all of the richer countries are green and trade among each other. And then we continue with dirty production elsewhere in the world, which actually is against our interests anyway, because it's not going to help us tackle the climate problem. Um, so we need to really make sure that we think about um, trade related climate policies as well, so that they don't undermine or disincentivize efforts of other countries. And that we find ways, policies and initiatives that support their efforts to transform production um, and to be able to export um, on the global, on, in the, in the, co competitively with green exports in the global economy. Um, and the key thing here is a few countries have the required resources, technology and expertise to convert to a low carbon economy. So we need to ensure they have access to these technologies, to the related investment, to the trade finance and the things that they need in order to build their own green industries to compete on a global scale. Um, uh, and that will also involve lever leveraging green tr trade finance and investment. It won't just be around sort of trade rules. Um, few, we really need to recall that few developing countries can match the scale of green industrial policies, subsidies, government procurement, and so on, that the EU and the US and others are able to unleash in this space. So how can they compete in this space unless we're really trying to help them build those industries? <clears throat> so I think at the WTO, we have two great initiatives on the table. As Antoine mentioned, we have the TESD process. It has 53 countries co-sponsoring it so far. Um, I mean, my personal ideal is we get to at least 80, if not 100 countries co-sponsoring that um, in time for the WTO ministerial. Um, and the point here is that a multilateral statement is vital just to signal and consolidate a willingness among countries to continue to cooperate and coordinate on these issues and to look for concrete solutions to problems together. Um, Madeline has, has emphasized some specific areas where, where, um, where, we, where we need work. Um, I think the key thing for the EU to do is to try and help craft a text that can engage and attract developing countries that they can be comfortable with. It might push them beyond their envelope of comfort, but that they can be comfortable enough with. And also um, to do the outreach to developing countries, which will take a lot of effort. You know, we need all of the countries who are supporting this, both developed and developing, to do the outreach. And we really need stakeholders, especially those who have networks in countries, to go out and, and, and leverage those networks and make sure that countries see that there's an interest in them of being part of this discussion. Um, on FFSR, the greatest news of the last few months has been that the EU is joining those as a co-sponsor. So I think that's a, a fantastic sign from the EU. It's the first G7 country. So I applaud all of you who've been behind the scenes trying to promote that, Haro, over the years. Um, hopefully we can get the UK and some key developing countries on board as well. And I think they're a really key discussion to be had is how do you facilitate, um, you know, the transition for countries away from fossil fuels, um, especially those that rely on fossil fuel exports. Um, you know, this is an issue not just for, you know, the obviously the OPEC countries, but for many African countries. This is a major source of their export revenue, so we need to think hard about that. I think I'm over time. I had a whole bunch of ideas around um, how they could mainstream in ways that also deliver on development goals, but I think I've said most of it. I can come back to it in the discussion, Harrow. Um, if that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, I'm sure we'll have that opportunity. I think we're all doing uh, very well on, on time. Uh, thanks in any case for highlighting not just uh, the progress, but also the, the importance uh, at the multilateral, multilateral level of ensuring um, that the concerns and considerations of developing countries are taken into account. And I think uh, that will probably be one of the themes uh, for the, for the Q&A later on, like what role can the EU play in, in that regard? Uh, at the multilateral level, but I'll save my questions and also uh, for, for, for later. Um, maybe just a reminder for the for the participants, uh, we're very much looking forward to your thoughts, your comments, and we'll try to take them on board in the Q&A that will come after the, the following speaker. So then the last speaker that we have uh, in terms of the opening remarks now uh, is uh, Laura Zankersmit. Um, of course, uh, you're a lawyer by training, but I'm sure you have a lot of different insights into uh, the EU's um, uh, trade and climate policy uh, from different angles. Uh, so I'm very much looking forward to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Haro. Um, and thank you also to the GovTran uh, project members for organizing this event. Um, it's already been quite interesting listening to all the speakers. Um, I also prepared something um, 
that addresses the, the first question that was asked to us, um, basically um, outlining the main um, challenges and achievements in mainstreaming um, climate change in, in EU trade policy. So I've, I have a short PowerPoint presentation that I'll um, start now. I hope everyone can see this. Um, and so, uh, in order to make it a bit equal, I thought I, I would list, um, in my view, two challenges that, uh, that still exist within EU trade policy to mainstream climate change policy um, uh, with, uh, in a free trade uh, policy, and uh, also two achievements. So two challenges and two achievements. The first is a more fundamental question that I, I don't think we really talked about uh, just yet, which is very much um, about why do we uh, even have free trade and how does that relate to um, our ambitions also to, uh, to tackle climate change and uh, protect the environment more generally. Um, and the second uh, challenge that I see is still the process of how the EU negotiates uh, FTAs. Um, and the two achievements um, that I will uh, shortly discuss are the uh, improvements in enforcement of environmental commitments in FTA. So a lot of this is actually about the free trade agreements that the EU negotiates. Um, but then the last achievement, which I think is the most significant, is uh, that the EU is uh, now stepping up its ambition in using autonomous or unilateral measures. You can frame it in two ways, I guess, to... Um, to um, tackle uh, trade and environmental interlinkages. Now, uh, to start with um, the first more fundamental issue, I wanted to uh, briefly discuss what I believe is a fundamental tension between the rationale for having a policy that is based on free trade, which most, uh, let's say, developed countries have, and uh, climate policy. And th this, is, um, this is a little um, flyer of the uh, Canadian government promoting the CETA, the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement between the EU and Canada, which uh, lists the opportunities and benefits um, for Canada's oil and gas uh, exporters. And it's a bit of a, a symbolic because Canada doesn't export that much oil and gas um, to the EU, but um, it underlines basically why we have um, a policy of free trade um, in the context of the WTO, but also uh, among most developing uh, nations and including in particular the EU. And that is um, that the policy justification for free trade is one based on economic growth measured in terms of increased production of goods. So that's very much based on this old um, international uh, trade theory that uh, free trade leads to comparative advantage. With comparative advantage, you get specialization. With specialization, you get economies of scale, and that ultimately leads to an increase in uh, consumer welfare, at least if you have some, some competition law policies um, as well. And um, the, um, the policy take that uh, the EU in particular takes from this is that that is a very good thing because that results in um, economic um, growth. So, um, and that is a very much an economic orientation that is very much in tension with, um, let's say, the challenges of the 21st century, where we're really trying to transition towards an economy that start, uh, tries to stay within, let's say, planetary boundaries. Uh, if we continue the way we do now, by 2050, we will need three planets Earth to uh, produce the uh, amount of resources that, um, um, uh, that are required to sustain current ways of living. And there was just an article published in, in Nature last Wednesday, which um, stated or what, which had researched that 58% of global oil reserves, 59% of uh, global gas reserves, and 89% of global coal reserves need to stay in the ground, so should not be um, um, excavated, uh, should not be um, uh, put above the ground in order to reach the goals of Paris. And for Canada in particular, 80% uh, of uh, the oil reserves need to stay into the ground because of uh, the way uh, uh, the oil is situated in Canada. It's mainly tar sands in Alberta. And um, so uh, that's very much opposed to this idea of giving um, tax credits, uh, uh, reducing taxes uh, in the forms of customs duties and protecting investment 
in fossil fuels, because all trade agreements that the EU uh, currently is negotiating or has that have an investment chapter protect all forms of, invest of investment, including investment in uh, fossil fuels. So there's still um, very much a tension, a, a general tension between this idea of why do we have free trade, economic benefits, and the need to stay within planetary boundaries as, when it comes to um, um, achieving Paris, but also um, uh, protecting the environment more generally within um, 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 the, on, on this planet. Uh, so I've been actually talking a lot about this first point, but I thought it was an important one. The second point that I still see in terms of challenges for EU trade po policy, mainstreaming climate change policy in EU trade policy is that I think the way the EU negotiates trade agreements is, although there have been quite some improvements in making it a bit more inclusive, is a very closed off process dominated uh, by uh, officials who are experts in, uh, in, in trade law and in international economic law. So we see very little, um, um, let's say, the, 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 the people who own the text of these trade agreements, that is the commission and the counterpart who uh, the EU is negotiating these trade agreements with. And we see within the common uh, commission, uh, even though it is uh, opening up a bit in terms of consulting NGOs and consulting the European Parliament and, and, and all of that, they're, st they're, they're still very much in charge of uh, the text of the FTAs. And I, I would very much uh, like to see uh, a more open approach towards negotiating trade agreements, which is more um, in line with, uh, let's say, um, a convention type of uh, negotiations that you have within international environmental law or even within the EU when it comes to the to uh, to, to, to new um, um, a new version of the EU treaties. Huh? So because uh, we see it still within the Commission, I, I listed here two forms of maladministration, uh, a tendency to disregard um, environmental interests when it comes to the negotiations um, of of um, of trade agreements. Huh? So um, uh, yeah, I, I don't have time to to go into detail, but uh, it's, it's rather unfortunate that uh, the Commission did not await the final um, uh, impact assessment report in the Mercosur negotiations, which is, of course, an agreement that's very controversial when it comes to um, um, the potential uh, negative environmental impact of that agreement on, uh, in particular, deforestation. Now, two uh, positive points. Um, very shortly, um, we see still that the EU is uh, in general, the commission at least, is, is opposed to um, attaching any kinds of um, um, consequences, uh, let's say um, in, to, in, the, in the form of trade uh, suspension or uh, trade uh, suspension of trade concessions, I must say, um, when it comes to the violation of TSD commitments. But we do see that um, this has changed for certain parts of the EU-UK trade and cooperation agreement, a very interesting agreement in that respect, because I think it can, can be uh, seen as somewhat of a, let's see, a first precedent where the EU is moving away from this, this idea that uh, sanctions should not, uh, in, under any circumstance, uh, be used. I'm using sanctions, but it's really about suspension of trade concessions. And um, what, what I think is also uh, quite positive is that we see a bit more ambition uh, with the Commission in these uh, non-papers in particular to use uh, the existing dispute set settlement mechanisms to address uh, non-compliance issues with other uh, parties and also very much hope that the other parties would do the same when it comes to um, the EU. Um, and then, um, yeah, last but not least is, um, is of course, uh, two very important um, uh, initiatives that the EU is undertaking now that are more of an autonomous nature, uh, seeking to um, mainstream, you could say, uh, climate change policy with, uh, in EU trade policy, and that's the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Uh, so the move away from uh, allocating free allowances to uh, domestic industry to um, subjecting um, importers to the EU's ETS. And uh, while well, we're still waiting for it, but the European Parliament has asked for it, um, an initiative on uh, deforestation and uh, the regulation of forest risk uh, commodities. And uh, here the, the European Parliament has asked for it, and I'm, I'm sure that the Commission will uh, 
come up with a proposal uh, given Ursula von der Leyen's uh, commitment to, um, um, to respond to European Parliament requests in that, uh, uh, in that way. But maybe uh, Madeleine Tanija can say a bit more about that. So um, yeah, those are my short uh, remarks. I tried to stay within uh, 10 minutes, so thank you. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Lawrence. And uh, I think it's only it's only right that as a as an uh, observer, as an external, like that you spend more time on the, on the on the critiques than also the positive points. But I'm happy that you ended on a positive note, also on some of the things that uh, that you think that the EU has achieved in the in the past uh, years. Um, I've already seen a number of comments in the in the Q and A box, and I'll start taking them up uh, in in a in a second. Um, so what I'm going to be doing now is I'm going to um, basically uh, direct these comments to, to the people that I think are our best place, or in some cases that's the, the comments are explicitly addressed at. Um, so I will start then with uh, the, the uh, comments, uh, or at least like some comments, and I'll take two of them together. Um, which are um, perhaps unsurprisingly about CBAM, so the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. Um, maybe a first uh, reflection, and maybe it's something that the panelists want to reflect on, upon as well. What I notice in the climate and trade discussions over uh, the past few years in particular, uh, particularly after the announcement of CBAM in the, in the EU Green Deal, is that it seems to take over pretty much all of the discussions that one has about climate and trade. And when we announced also this, uh, this webinar, we didn't want to make it a webinar about CBAM as such, but very clearly, and you can see that again from the Q&A, but also uh, some of the interventions, very clearly uh, CBAM has, has the, the capacity uh, to, to uh, uh, put other topics which also are relevant uh, a little bit to the side. And maybe my general question for all of the panelists to just keep in the back of their minds is, is that a healthy development? Is it uh, all right that so much of the, the, the political energy, uh, the technical thinking about climate and trade interactions um, is, is taken up uh, by, by uh, the design of, of this particular measure? But let me then move on to a more a targeted question uh, based on uh, the comments that I've seen in the, in the Q&A so far. Um, and that is the comments about the design of, of, the, of the CBAM. And Marlene, I'm going to take these two questions and, and direct them at you, because I think the two questions that I've seen in the Q&A both concern the impacts that CBAM may have on developing countries. So one question is about uh, the administrative burden uh, that CBAM may, may, uh, may pose in terms of the monitoring and reporting that will be required uh, for the in terms of the imports coming into the EU. Um, and I guess there's a, a two pronged question. One is a more a, a legal question of whether uh, these types of requirements could be seen as non trade barriers. At the same time, I think there's also the more political question about well, what can the EU do to make sure that uh, to, to basically support other countries and um, to support particularly least developed countries that might be facing uh, facing these barriers. Um, or facing these burdens uh, when they want to export to the EU. And this finally links to another of the comments and questions in the, in the Q&A box so far. It's like, how does this relate to the EU's um, commitments under the Paris Agreement to make sure that it takes the lead, um, to make sure that it does so taking into account common but differentiated responsibilities of, of different parties. Um, so I think there's a, a, an initial question of like, okay, are these, uh, are these administrative requirements to monitor and report on the carbon footprint of products, can they be considered uh, a non-tariff uh, non, uh, barrier? Um, and the second and more political question, like what can the EU do to help support countries that might face uh, these burdens and that may well still want to continue to export uh, to the EU? So Madeleine, these two uh, questions are, I think are, are for you to, to respond to. Thank you so much. Oh gosh, all, all these things in this little time slot. I'm going to abuse my replies by first responding to one point that Lawrence uh, highlights because this is very dear to our heart. I dare say that we are one of the most transparent um, institutions 
um, not because tax leak, <laughs> but because at least DG Trade, we have, um, I think, quite a track record following all the debates about uh, TTIP and, and CETA um, uh, in making our text available. We are the only ones with a structured dialogue in, form, in the form of stakeholders. We have SIAs. Um, look, we've been pushing in the WTO very much. That's very innovative what we have there. Um, there's a formal dialogue with stakeholders through test. So I'm, I'm happy to, to give all the examples, but um, I would not want to leave the impression that we, we are opaque. Um, actually, there is a very, very strong engagement and, and transparency also in terms of text. And we continue to be very willing to engage uh, with stakeholders. And I'm happy to come to your university also to talk and answer them and to explain that. So CBAM. Now, I think overall, um, maybe what we need to realize is, and when I said earlier, there's a difference between when um, the EGA talks collapsed, if you want, or put on hold in the fridge in 2016. And today, I think in 2016, we were talking about this issue of PPMs, uh, uh, products. Um, um, so basically, it tells how is a product made. I, you don't see that on the base of the characteristic of a product when it enters at the border. In 2016, that was the exception. Uh, we were all saying PPMs and WTO, that's very difficult. Today, look at the Green Deal. It's full of PPMs in one or another way. We are concerned about what happens in the supply chain of a product. And that poses a big challenge because that, 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 that exceeds the European border that requires international collaboration. It, 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 if you have a solar panel, which was made with um, polysilicon that was made, generated by electricity, that was generated by coal mines. Is it a clean product or not? I don't have the, the, the immediate answer to it, but these are the challenges in today's discussion. So I think that the, the concept of PPMs is out there. Now, whether you, you translate that then, is that a barrier or not, is very much how you go about it. And, and what we are trying to develop now is a toolbox that would say, okay, well, definitely it is WTO compatible. That, that already by definition needs to look at the least restrictive. You need to have an environment or climate objective, least restrictive, et cetera. Um, but that's not enough for us. For us, we say as DG Trade, yeah, but you also in parallel need to develop an international strategy of outreach. How are you going to do that? How are you going to work together with others? Uh, how are you going to explain in the case of CBAM? This is not a barrier. This is simply saying we, we have a pact. We need to implement Paris and we need green products. This is climate mitigation. So if, if, you, if you don't play the game, I don't want to have carbon leakage coming to Europe. I don't want to have um, a clean, um, uh, um, uh, clean, clean uh, steel produced in Europe and then import dirty steel. That's what it is about. So if you import to Europe, you can do it, but you import clean steel. Um, now, I recognize that, that that doesn't solve the problem in China, because for, imagine China has a part of a production clean and part dirty, and that they decide and say, I only send the clean stuff to Europe. So no problem with CBAM because uh, no, no additional charges, but it sells everywhere around the dirty stuff. Um, you don't serve the climate with that. that that's called the, the reshuffling problem, which we certainly need to address. So that also shows that you can never, even if you have unilateral measures, it's very important that you have an international strategy. We're dealing with a global challenge, not an EU challenge. The climate doesn't respect the border. Um, so uh, NCB, no, but you can design it as NCB and or not. Then the other thing in our toolbox, what we think is important, that we have special consideration for developing countries, and we've been going through it at length. If you look at the countries that are impacted by CBAM, it's it's not really the LDCs and the DCs. I mean, I wouldn't qualify Russia as, an, as a developing country. So um, I think there's one country in Africa where you could have an aluminium impact but we've been engaging with them to find solutions to it. So we're actually uh, outside uh, CBAM, there's a program to help them to um, get cleaner electricity in a way. Um, so yes, you, you need to look at, at the impact, but it, it, there have been discussions in, should you exclude developing countries for CBAM? You're not helping them with that. You're not helping developing countries by saying, continue to, to produce clean, pro uh, dirty products. You're helping them by setting up a, a, a massive side program to help them with the green transition. So that's certainly what we, what we are doing. And the other thing that we've done is that we've been built in quite a lengthy transition. It's not that CBAN comes, boom. Um, there's a very long uh, transitional period. Then there's first the three years of a tryout that people can learn and get used to monitoring and reporting, et cetera. So I think that that would be my, 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 my reply to the entities. Remind me of the second one that you said. 
So the second part of the question was about uh, least developed countries and how the EU can support, uh, because they're not excluded as such from, from CBAM, um, but how the EU can support these countries in the burdens that they, they may face. Okay, no, so but, um, I, I, for me, this question by definition goes beyond CBAM because as I said, they're, they're basically not affected uh, by it. If you look at the scope of sectors uh, covered in the current CBAM, you, you, you basically don't get to LDCs. As I said, you have one LDC um, uh, with whom we are working already. Um, but beyond this, for any Green Deal measure, we are working very closely with uh, INFA um, because that's a total priority for EU um, development data and the Green Deal. Um, so we're one by one, whether it is the due diligence legislation, whether it is uh, CBAM, one by one looking at how to um, redirect our, our um, capacity building to the countries to help them with the green transition. Um, so that, that, that's a huge, uh, that's a huge um, effort. And I would also say that if you look in, in the WTO, we're really trying to, to uh, build that in and also make a, a, a bigger a connection to um, uh, between what is the classical market opening, uh, between the needs of the developing country, looking into more innovative ways to address the fact um, that they often don't produce these, what Caroline was referring to, how can you then help them develop these type of technologies? Um, so that, that, that is also in the WTO uh, a big part of the effort. Right, let me take that uh, last comment and then move on to um, maybe both Antoine and, and Carolyn, whoever wants to, to respond. Um, and that's about more the positive, because partly what we're talking about here is the EU taking measures, whether it's CBAM or mandatory due diligence legislation, um, and then uh, dealing with the impacts on other countries uh, after the fact. But there's also the more proactive, positive approach that the, the EU can, do can adopt either through its direct engagement with, uh, with countries or through multilateral discussions. Um, so maybe the question, Antoine and, and Karen, where do you think um, the EU's, like what do you think the most uh, important, like what should be prioritized? Where, where should the EU put its prioritization in terms of making sure that uh, other countries will have a, a clear perception that whatever the EU is doing uh, on trade and climate change, it's good for them? And um, yeah, I, get, I, get, I guess that, that's okay with you, uh, uh, What are the priorities? Really, that's an enormous question. You see, there's a number, such number of issues too that could be uh, that could be addressed. Um, of course, when it comes to um, at the multilateral level, uh, I will not dwell on that too long because there are some obvious issues with the, of the way the WTO rules are are, are constructed. With, what is a like product? What are the discriminatory measures based on origin and, and the like? But these are multilateral in essence, or perhaps multilateral. So the EU in itself has an influence, yes, but is not the um, is um, not the only player in the in, in, in the particular game. So when, uh, if we talk a bit more on the bilateral level, where the EU in its uh, actually um, importance when it's negotiating. A, a free trade agreements, I would build back on, on what Lawrence uh, mentioned a bit earlier, is that there has been progress lately, I think. So some of the latest FTAs that have been negotiated, including with the, with the UK and some, um, some others, have shown progress in terms of how provisions are su sustainable, environmental and social provisions are embedded in the trade and sustainable development chapters. But there's, um, I think there's always a way to do more there. And this is something that we could do. And this is something that perhaps even our partners sometimes are calling for. So that's what I'm talking about the case of New Zealand, for instance, on the free trade agreements that we are currently negotiating. There is a demand for the dispute settlement mechanism to actually have more uh, broad coverage in the which provision that it is um, that it is covering. And so this is something that we could do. This is a point that Lawrence made and that we could like uh, could uh, build on is how to make sure that the dispute settlement mechanism of free trade agreements actually has a broad coverage, including on its environmental and social uh, provisions. That would be a very strong in uh, incentive, of course, for all um, EU partners in how to foster sustainability in the, in the rest of the world. So this, for me, I would say, is uh, something that we something that we can do. Um, operationalize uh, effective measures in the environmental and social provisions in uh, the, TS, the TSD, and a broader perspective on the on the dispute settlement mechanism in FTAs. 
This is something that I think we can. Um, a, a very quick point that I would like to make specifically on the, on the vulnerability, on the need to actually involve uh, our other countries, and especially developing countries, the ones that are more impacted uh, socially and economically by, the, by, this kind of, by this kind of measures. I fully agree with the point that Karen made that it is essential that we uh, that we involve them in the in the discussion and not we stay at the club of five uh, somewhere somewhere out, out there. And uh, again, um, some some members are quite efficient and quite uh, willing and quite uh, proactive in this kind of discussion. I take the example of the ACP group in, uh, in Geneva, which has been instrumental in recent uh, trade negotiation, especially with regards to the uh, trade facilitation agreement. And the EU and the ACP group have worked well in the final stretch of the, the negotiation of that, uh, of that agreement. So this is something that could be uh, replicated, for instance. But yeah, just a quick point on fully agree with Karine on the need to actually involve uh, developing countries and climate vulnerable countries in the discussion at the multilateral level. Thank you, Antoine. Carolyn, do you also want to add to this? Uh, yes, sure. Um, and I also would like to reply to one of the questions, if I may, that's in the box. Um, so I was just thinking, I'm thinking out loud here based on Madeline's comments, because she said that one of the strategies of the EU is to think about, you know, a side program of assistance. And perhaps, you know, without, you know, going back to this old long-standing call just for more money or more assistance or more capacity building it's really time to grapple carefully with what that looks like um you know so we've got a european green deal which is a huge you know cross-government effort to transform the economy and so the question is how could the eu work with other countries internationally as sort of that global level green deal and it it seems to me that a starting point would be you know maybe the eu needs a strategy you know around you know, global approaches to greening trade. And the first thing is to develop a process or strategy for consulting with and listening to developing country governments and stakeholders about their priorities on climate and trade, supply chains, ways that they can generate jobs. And this is not only going to help the EU, it's going to help the countries themselves. Because for many, many years, we've all said what you need most in country also is for them to develop trade strategies that better account for environmental concerns and climate issues and to engage with stakeholders. So in a way, this is a way of triggering a process within countries as well, that we should all be doing this to discover where the tensions lie, where the opportunities lie um, for those countries. So, and this could sort of be linked to sort of, you know, a process of independent impact assessments in trading countries around, in, 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 um, in trading partners around their climate trade priorities, the climate impacts of existing trade flows, um, impacts of trade related climate policies that others are introducing and, you know, and also, you know, uh, yeah, impacts of climate on their, on their trade and on their trading prospects, which is a huge issue for many developing countries that they're looking at. Um, so I think it would just be useful to think if we could use this side program of transition to sort of catalyze a process of supporting countries themselves to integrate climate and environmental issues into their trade strategy and policy agendas. Um, and what, one thing that I think is really, really needed in this space is we have this huge amount of money, not enough, but uh, money supposed to be going into climate finance and environmental um, uh, support to developing countries. We have this huge effort to try and uh, mobilize sustainable finance for climate. We have aid for trade. We have calls to you know, de-fossil de fuel trade finance and use trade finance for positive benefits. Many developing country export exporters say, green exporters say what they really need is more trade finance. So to me, something really concrete that could be done is let's have a high level summit that brings together these different pieces and says, how are we gonna to work together to transform the global economy? That's gonna be partly about money from the public sector. It's gonna be partly about leveraging private sector investment. And it's gonna be also about making sure we have an enabling policy environment. But I, I think it would send a huge positive mess, message because it would be acknowledging that this is going to take enormous resources um, and policy engagement to make this transformation in developing countries also. So this could be, this is a proposal that I, I, I think, you know, have some kind of high level summit on climate friendly economic, economic transformation um, in developing countries um, that listens to the kinds of priorities that they're setting out in this space. Um, but that's enough on that. The one question I wanted to take up, which Richard has put here, is that CBAM is interesting in that it targets products that are largely the domain of major multinationals. 
sometimes lodged in less advanced economies. And I just wanted to take that up because it's something that, that has troubled me for years in international trade negotiations is we talk about trade as though it's something that only happens between states, when in fact it's uh, multinationals who are, who are the, uh, or international supply chains comprised of many companies that are actually managing this trade, many of whom have legs in multiple constituencies or parts in multiple. And some of these sectors are dominated by five or six, you know, when we talk about agricultural trade, it's really about top 10 companies, right, who are managing most of agricultural trade. So it's always seemed to me we have this disconnect and that maybe in the climate space as well, it would uh, be beneficial from that point of view to talk about supply chains more and particular sectors and how they operate. And I think Madeline was moving in this direction when she was talking about the need to look at particular climate problems we have along certain supply chains, whether it's about getting low carbon technologies to markets that need them, or it's about making certain supply chains more sustainable. The key is we need to be finding ways to work with those actors. And it's true, we shouldn't let some of the most polluting actors escape pressure just because they're based in less, in less developed countries. You know, They should be facing this pressure wherever they are to upgrade. They surely have the resources, the access to capital and so on to do so. They may need government support, you know, but um, on some fronts, but I don't have an answer to that, Richard, but I, I think it's a very, very good point and one that we tend to operate in a very state centric world when we talk about the WTO. Um, and that's probably something that we need to think about more hard when we think about climate and trade intersections as well going forward. But it might also help us break down some of the north south issues too, if we look at it um, in a different in a different way as well. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, Madeleine, I saw you had your hand up, so you probably want to respond to this. No, I think I just wanted to fine tune a bit this um, and don't leave the impression that uh, that for us, uh, the um, developing countries is an issue of the side program of technical assistance. I think it's an integral part of it. Um, uh, and what I forgot to say, and I think Lawrence, you, you alluded to it, or was it you, Antoine? the importance of international uh, bodies and international standards. Actually, most if you look at due diligence, what we, what we want and what we're doing is building on international standards. So what we've been doing, for example, one of the success formula that we've had in due diligence collaboration with other countries, we've created about six years ago, a huge project in Asia and now in Latin America involving the OECD and the ILO in first instance, and now also the UN, um, who are actually executing this project. Um, and the response of it is a win-win because the, 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 the companies in, in these countries, by the way, they also want to be green. It's not that they don't want to be green. We, we don't have these sort of uh, unilateral say of we want to be green. They also want to be green. And these companies realize that that's the future and want to work with the OECD and the ILO. And by doing this, we've also forced the international organizations to collaborate on it, to not have competing due diligence guidelines. So um, I, I very much take the point of Caroline, yeah, you need to have a strategy and involve a developing country in doing that. But at the same time, you also need to look per type of legislation um, and, and go down to the country under specific needs. A good example is cocoa. You know, there, there are some countries, we are working with two countries in Africa and cocoa. That's the biggest commodity there is. I don't need to talk about many other pieces of legislation, but deforestation is going to affect them and child labor is going to affect them. So there you need a very zoomed in tool. Uh, and there we've set up a, a, a whole exercise invol involving also stakeholders and governments um, and discussions on legislative uh, proposals. So there will not be a one size fits all. Um, and it is, uh, for me, it is really a part of, not a side uh, strategy. If you talk Cocoa, you talk uh, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, you talk, I mean, you don't talk the US and you don't talk to Pakistan, but you talk specific countries that are least developed countries. So if you impose deforestation legislation, by definition, you need to zoom in that country. What's that going to mean for you? How, how can we help you to actually comply with that future legislation? And what is the tool that we need to work with? Thank you, Madeleine. Um, Laurus, um, I want to move on to you as well, and maybe you have some thoughts on, on, on this, uh, this question too. Um, but one thing that really struck me about uh, your uh, short remarks was uh, the call for a different type of, of trade agreement, where they are approached more like uh, international environmental agreements, or as you mentioned, also the EU treaty. Um, and this, the reason this struck me is that we now, uh, as, as many of you will know, we have ongoing negotiations uh, in a different context on plurilateral agreements uh, on climate change, trade and sustainability. 
And what I find intriguing about this particular uh, agreement is that it is indeed framed, not as a trade agreement as such, but as something cross-cutting. So maybe my question to you is, is, can you specify a little bit more, like should we move away from the idea that this is ultimately about uh, trading goods and services, um, but that is uh, more broadly about achieving certain sustainable uh, sustainability objectives? Um, so that's a broad question, as I said, um, but maybe you want to respond to some of the other things that have come up as well. Thank you, Havo. Um... Yeah, I'm uh, now debating which which uh, question to take first. I think, um, um, yeah, that's why I, I uh, I'll address your your question um, uh, first. So, um, how should these negotiations happen? These these trade negotiations, and and um, the the reason I made my first point on more of a um, there was more of a policy nature of a rationale. Why do we have trade agreement first? Is I think that that gets completely sidelined you get immediately when these negotiations happen when it comes to FTAs um, it's already assumed that it will be about uh, eliminating tariffs and, uh, and and quantitative restrictions and then we'll do something uh, in addition to that on uh, for instance uh, the trade and sustainable development chapter or we have uh, provisions on cooperation and competition uh, law matters all, all these kind of things so like the, the, the more fundamental questions kind of get sidestepped. And um, I wanted to then immediately to also respond to, to the response by, by Madeleine, because I, I agree very much with her that the commission has made um, great progress in being more transparent. That's certainly the case. I have witnessed this. I have uh, been a participant in many uh, stakeholder consultations. I've even been uh, a member of the trade agreement experts uh, group for for a few months. So uh, I know that this is the case, but transparency is not the same as uh, a more inclusive, deliberative outcome. And that is more what I was uh, trying to hint at. And um, if you have a more convention style um, negotiation, you might also be able to open up the more fundamental uh, questions that, that get uh, sidelined, I think, um, with, uh, with most of these uh, trade agreements. It's very much a, 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 um, a, a template that has been used since 1948. 1948 is a very long time ago that the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade was negotiated. It's just, uh, it, it's very much a, a 20th century way of thinking and looking at uh, our problems, huh? and we've moved on. We have very different problems that face us uh, this, uh, this, this century. Um, responding to uh, the, 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 the points on um, the developing countries, I think where there is one particular um, issue where I think um, a lot uh, could be done in the trade context, uh, and that, is, that uh, um, comes to technology transfer, green technologies, compulsory licensing, and allowing for local content requirements for developing countries uh, in these particular um, um, uh, um, technologies. So very much, um, yeah, it, it would take a bit too much time to, to elaborate this, so I'll just refer to a paper I wrote with Jessica Lawrence. Um, from the um, uh, um, yeah, from just she just switched universities. She's now at the University of Essex, um, and I wrote a, a paper um, outlining how FTAs um, could look like. In particular, also addressing this issue of intellectual property protection, which is always very much at the forefront of FTAs, which very much try to protect intellectual property. And I think more can be done there to make sure that intellectual property is actually transferred to um, developing countries. All right, thank you, Lawrence. Um, there's a few questions from the, uh, the Q&A that haven't been addressed yet. So I'll, I'll start with, with one of them and uh, I hope to still take up the other one uh, in, a, in a minute. Um, and I find it uh, a very uh, good question in the sense of, it's also something that I've seen a lot, but, but not that much evidence. And it's a question about the effects of TSD chapters. Um, now we know that TSG chap chapters, of course, have all kinds of provisions. Uh, they include, let's say, provisions on, on certain types of cooperation that the EU might want to pursue with, with other countries. Um, but what we see less uh, of is what happens afterwards. What happens with these provisions? What are the effects in uh, partner countries 
So to what extent do we have uh, knowledge and evidence of the effects of certain types of provisions? And then maybe looking forward, what types of provisions might be uh, thought of or conceived of when it comes to actually uh, strengthening those effects. So what types of provisions might we need in TSD chapters to actually have the strongest environmental outcome? Um, I'm thinking of uh, you, Madeleine, as maybe the, the best person to uh, respond to this question, but maybe uh, uh, Antoine or, or Lawrence and uh, Caroline have some thoughts on this question as well. Um, look, um, I mean, I've, as I've said, we, we've launched a review and this is a review on the effectiveness of the um, implementation of these chapters. So, um, uh, and the reason for doing that is that we had promised to do that in the trade policy review, but also we, we, our strategy is based on the so-called 15 point action plan, um, where we announced that we would review the strategy we've set out. My first remark would be that um, we've made a choice in the type of chapters we have. And the choice we've made is that we want to support the multilateral system. That, that's a choice. Uh, and the moment you enter into that avenue, you're, you're bound by international agreements. And if you look at our chapters, to a large extent, they're based on, or they're reinforced and they, they make enforceable the, uh, the standards, the, the core, core standards, the ILO, huh, that's for the labor front, and then um, the multilateral environment agreements for the environment. That's the basic rationale you see. So you need to go to these MEAs to see what you have. And that means that you have multilateral environment agreements, MEA. So that means the Paris Agreement, that means the Stockholm Agreement, that means uh, all of them, the CITES. And probably out of all of these, CITES is the strongest. If you go to CITES, uh, wildlife uh, trafficking, you have, uh, you have a ban. So you, you have an inherently stronger, and if you go to a couple of the biodiversity ones, it's more a reporting system. So, so your, your, your strength is that you, uh, you don't create deviating standards and you're trying to strengthen that multilateral system, but at the same time, your weakness is that you refer to and what if that agreement is weak. And the difficulty we face there is that we do not want, I mean, we, we cannot fix in trade issues that we haven't been able to fix in dedicated fora. Um, and, and we need to avoid sort of a perception that we are, um, apparently we need to have more collaborative approaches with countries to advance. We need to avoid this impression that trade can fix it by having sanctions. And, and that is very much at the heart of the debate. And entering that avenue totally undermines even all your outreach to developing countries. So we, we are in, an, in a sort of complex, because if you go to France and the national debate there, to a large extent is put a ban at the border. I have a high EU standard and don't accept the imports of any product that doesn't mean the high EU um, international standards. And I have sympathy for that. I understand that it's probably mostly driven by competitiveness reason, but that's not how we are going to promote and, and set um, global standards on, on, on environment. So I, I think it's important to, I'm elaborating a bit, but I think it's important to understand where we are now that you then I mean, the chapters have also evolved. Huh? We also have thematic articles. And if you look at deforestation, uh, we are referring also to the, to the national um, uh, legislation that we're making. One of the reflection, of course, there's now is we have the Green Deal. How, how should that be reflected then in, in, in the chapter? Does it mean that we have increased the platform function, that we have these measures and we want to look at the measures that you have and how you do that? These are questions to, to, to be answered. Um, but I think fundamentally, th this is a very important uh, point that is there, and then you can complement it. Now, that is within the TSD chapters. Beyond that, of course, I mean, environment and climate should be mainstreamed in, throughout an agreement. We are doing some things already because by definition, we liberalize the environmental friendly goods in tariffs, we liberalize services, so that dimension is done already. But what can you do more in government procurement? Um, what is the interaction between these chapters and how can you make that uh, interact better? And then there's also a whole discussion is, um, uh, for example, Indonesia. When you zoom in on a concrete FTA, what is your problem with Indonesia? There's a palm oil issue. How are you solving it? You probably don't need a cross-cutting across all FTA solution, but you do need a solution, whether you say, I'm going to recognize certificates, I'm going to do it in a different way. You, you do need to look at the concrete trade patterns that you have with the country, what are the sustainability questions, and what is your answer to that? I, I'll leave it there. All right, and then uh, for uh, now that you already have your hand up for you and for the other panelists, I guess, 
put, if you can put yourself in into a motherland's unenviable uh, position, like what would you do different? Like what types of of uh, chapters or what types of of agreements uh, would you like to see? Yeah, it's of course a very difficult position uh, to be in. Um, I um, the the point I wanted to make on on, on sanctions is sanctions i think it's not, not a good word it's more about suspension of, uh, of trade concessions is it all depends on what you have to offer so um if this is really important to you for instance that the other party adheres to its nationally determined contribution under the paris agreement for instance then make sure that that party is willing to commit so you can you can do that in in various ways you can talk to uh, that uh, party and see in what ways that could actually be achieved. And then you can say, well, this is really important to us. So we're going to make it just as important as what we have negotiated on intellectual property protection in the chapter on intellectual property protection. I have to, to just to name uh, one example um, or, uh, you know, on customs duties or something like that. Um, a second comment that I would like to make is I think uh, what would be good again, and that relates to the a point uh, we talked about before, Haro, is uh, it also depends on who you are talking to exactly. And uh, maybe it's necessary to, to broaden the scope of who sits at the table. Because I can um, imagine that uh, maybe uh, the, the narrow world of trade officials that is present at the negotiations might be thinking very much in terms of their narrow economic interests, but it could be that the local population, for instance, um, would actually be very uh, much in favor of making sure that both the EU and its government uh, commit seriously to, uh, to, to uh, uh, the Paris Agreement. So um, yeah, I, I, think, I think those two, those two points would be uh, very important to me if I would be in uh, Ms. Teininghaus very, um, difficult uh, shoes. Oh, hopefully, uh, uh, Melanie, your shoes are not too, too, too uncomfortable, but... Um... No, but I, <laughs> I can immediately respond. Uh, sure. So uh, first of all, it's not trade officials doing the negotiations. It's the entire commission uh, and all these positions are prepared. So the, the team is actually the climate colleagues, environment colleagues um, and, and, and trade. Um, what I didn't mention, but actually on climate, we've stepped up significantly because um, we're now going to make the Paris Agreement in compliance with it an essential elements clause. Uh, an essential elements clause basically means that it is so important that if you breach that, um, uh, we can even withdraw from the whole agreement. Um, and and sort, sort of the whole suggestion, this avenue, how can you tighten that up, what you already have, including NDCs, that, that is certainly, yeah, that, then you can enter into a different discussion. Then you can say, okay, I commit to Paris, but actually I want to look into more. Uh, I want to make these NDCs of other things or how you go about it part of a joint recommendation or you, you make additional tools on that. So how can you deepen the international um, uh, commitment? So there, 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 there we are on it. But I think we've done actually quite a lot and even not concluding uh, negotiations with those who do not commit to uh, the net zero commitments at uh, uh, 2050 um, is also in the trade policy review is an additional uh, leverage that we are using. Right, thank you, Manlin. Um, one question that I, uh, I just wanted to, to raise, and maybe I'll send it uh, again in the direction of uh, either Antoine and or uh, Carolyn, whoever wants to respond, um, is about uh, two of uh, the, the EU's partners that we haven't really talked about yet today, um, and that's some of the major trading nations, the United States and China. Now, obviously, a lot of the things that the EU has been doing and uh, and can do uh, will also depend on how uh, they are received and how they also may leverage cooperation and, and climate action from these countries. Um, are there particular um, pathways that you see for the EU in the near future to actually try and make sure that, that these countries um, step up their climate action through the means of trade policy? And if so, how would that look like? Thank you, Haro. This is an extremely difficult uh, question, obviously. Um, really has to do with um, 
would I, how would I, how would I put this? When you come to the to the US and and, and China, you see that they already have obviously have their uh, political interest um, at heart, and that they are. We were hoping that at the multilateral level things would be a bit more smoother than the past few years. It appears it is not going to be that simple, and of course there are some major aspects uh, going to. Uh, when it comes to China and uh, intellectual property and technology transfers and the like, um, one of the uh, it's going to be it's going to be a broad point because unfortunately I won't make very very, very specific. But broadly speaking, it also has to do with the uh, difficulties of the WTO rules, the, multi the rules at the multilateral level. They are extremely stringent. They are extremely strict. We've mentioned when you talk to when we talk about CBAM, when we talk about other aspects, how. It has to be uh, put in a way that it is compliant because of the rules, because this can be extremely, extremely uh, rigid. And uh, the way that the, the trade relations have been, have been built on the background of the WTO is part of the world that doesn't exist anymore, as Lawrence said a bit, uh, a bit earlier. And especially when it comes to, for instance, the, the, how we consider countries, what is a developing country, what is a least developing country, et cetera. And these are boxes in which countries have been put that were that perhaps made sense at the time. No? But that is now we are now in a very different, different um, economic environment and global environment. And perhaps these boxes are now more um, problematic than everything when it comes to, to discussion at the multilateral level and or can be of a, um, not, not an assistance, but can um, not detrimental to countries to pursue their own interests. They, they actually profit from these uh, um, from these rigidities to actually pursue their own interests that are usually not in favor of more uh, of environmental um, sustainability. So I'm afraid I don't have an answer here because uh, as we talk about the EU in terms of free trade agreements, bilateral free trade agreements, the EU has should have an influence on how, the, what kind of rules are there, what, how we implement, how we operationalize these rules. Again, it's not mm -hmm. the, fact that, the fact that the Paris Agreement is an essential element is a great progress. And, but, and now it's about how to operationalize the provisions rather than just, that, than just having them there. But uh, when it comes to US and China and these major interests, um, I, really have, I wanted to make this point about the rigidity of rules at the multilateral level and how this can be a hindrance to actual uh, meaningful discussion on environmental sustainability. But otherwise, I'm happy to give the floor to, um, to Lawrence or Karen if they want to make a point. And let me just double check. Karen may not actually be there uh, at the moment. Uh, I think she had something else coming in, in between. Um, let me then just quickly ask one final question. And, and uh, if you can keep your answer very short, that would be uh, great. Okay, Caroline, I see you're back. I will give you the floor. Uh, I will give you the last word even, but maybe a very quick uh, response from Madeleine for a question that has been there for a while, but it hasn't been answered yet. Um, and that's about renewable energy subsidies. Um, and the extent to which the, the Green Deal um, is, uh, is or is not influencing the discussions on renewable energy subsidies in the context of the WTO or EU free trade agreements, whether you have anything to say on that. I mean, uh, oof, I, um, I would need to have to reflect on this. I've never made that link. Um, I, I don't think that we have any, any subsidy that we think is uh, incompatible. <laughs> Um, I mean, one of the biggest discussions we are having um, is the fossil fuel subsidies, huh? um, and our wish to, uh, to uh, at least as a commission, as DG Trade, are, I mean, the fossil fuels are the subsidies, I don't think I need to explain here for all those who know a lot about climate, how relevant it is for climate, um, but um, within the EU it is a very delicate topic, so we need to get all member states on board to move that, but at least we now are in a position that we can engage um, on the discussion on transparency of, of these subsidies, but this has not been part of the, uh, at least not of Fit, fit for 55, um, but it is still, still out there, we need to do a couple of steps um, uh, on that, but for the rest on, on the, I mean, more broadly the uh, subsidies. No, I wouldn't see now immediately of the measures that we at least the packets that has come out now. Um, of course, we look that they are compatible with the WTO and don't undermine our our objectives, also our green objectives in the WTO. Right. Thanks, Madeleine. Um, then I will give the last words to Caroline. Um, I'm happy to see you back again. Um, 
Uh, I hope you still got, got the question. So the question was about uh, the the, uh, the EU and uh, China and the US, but maybe a broader question about how uh, broader geopolitics influence uh, climate and trade uh, uh, interactions. Uh, but generally, you can also just respond to other questions. Uh, you have the last words, so the last few minutes are for you. Wait. I, I will make a strategic move and, and duck the US-China-EU um, question. However, I did just want to say that I think um, one of the points that I think came out of this discussion is just, it, it may sound trite, but I, I think consult, consult, consult is really important and who we consult is important. Um, and I think Lohans makes a, a good general point that it's true that, I mean, the EU may be doing a good, a better job than it used to, but many governments around the world do not have the people they need around the table when they're negotiating trade deals, especially on environment issues and even more so on the climate front. So to actually be driving their countries and their economies in the direction they want, who needs to be at the table? And it's not going to be just the export, you know, the key export interests at, at hand. So I think that's a key thing to making this, shifting this dynamic. A second thing is I, I feel that um, we may have a whole set of trade related problems, but the solutions may not be in trade rules. You know that solutions may be elsewhere so it may be about developing climate standards or looking at finance and trade or looking at other areas and i think we need to be careful about always looking first to the rules as the answer I mean, in general trade politics has been dominated by lawyers for way too long as so you actually think about how do you actually make transformation in countries you know that comes through there's many different ways in which you even transform national national policy making, you know, there's all different kinds of instruments that are at the disposal of a major power like the EU for making its influence felt. Um, and I, I think that we need to just look very carefully at the effectiveness of um, punitive measures, whether they're penalties or they're sanctions or how we wish to, to, you know, there's no doubt we need to create pressure. The question, how do you create pressure that's effective? And I mean, there's been much scholarship over the last 30 years on the effectiveness of sanctions in general as a tool for foreign policy and where they work and where they don't. And I think as people in the environmental community, we need to look really hard at that and work out where these actually help and where they can be actually create unintended consequences that undermine your goal. Um, and that's a hard conversation. I mean, I mean, I think empirically, it's a question. Where, where are they most effective? Um, uh, yeah, I think I, think I should probably um, stop there. But thank you, Harold, for the opportunity. All right. Thanks, Caroline, for these uh, final wise words. And thanks to all of the panelists for uh, their time and their participation and, and their, their insights uh, on, on the topic of EU climate and trade policy. Um, we're out of time, so I'll have to wrap it up now. So thanks also, of course, to all of the participants who have joined us today. Um, and for those of you who are interested, uh, there will be uh, more sessions of the final conference series of the GovTran network. So next week, there will be the next session on the 21st of September. There will be the next webinar, uh, which will be about the EU Green Deal and citizen participation, speaking of consultation. Um, so hopefully we'll see many of you there again. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us. And thanks for listening. And uh, thanks again to the panelists and hope to see you all soon, preferably in person. <laughs>